industrialization. It made Britain rich and it made Britain sick. In the ever-expanding cities, a phantom was abroad, disease. 200 years ago, disease was as mysterious and terrifying as it had been 2,000 years ago. People didn't know where disease came from, what it was, or for the most part, how to cure it. These wax heads show the true horrors of the diseases of the age. Smallpox, typhus, tuberculosis had absolutely terrible consequences. On the ever more crowded streets, those consequences were intensifying. But the same age that saw disease increase was also to witness discoveries that laid the foundation of today's healthcare and made medicine modern. century, Britons had one overriding personal concern, their health. With good reason, average life expectancy was 36 years. People generally treat themselves based on little more than superstition, magic and hearsay. There were trained doctors, but without an accurate way to diagnose or cure illness, your chances of survival were limited. Those common medical treatment was bloodletting. This was thought to restore balance to the body and purge those ailments that uh, people thought lurked in the blood. This treatment was not only useless, but positively dangerous. Most old people need all the blood they can get, but with medical practice based on misunderstandings 2,000 years old, it's not surprising, I suppose, that anybody I believe they'll come up with a theory to prolong life or stave off disease. In fact, a new type of medical entrepreneur was getting rich by doing precisely that. On the crowded streets of Britain's cities, they set out their wares. Good evening, sir. Well, Nicole, no, no, it's home with a vegetable syrup, make it all ourselves in a Cornish cave. The wonderful poultice here, cure all your ill, we'll make a short sort. They were known as quacks. Two of London's most famous were John Ball and Joshua Ward. Now, some of these pills and potions could be very, very odd indeed. John Ball sold this very strange medicine, made of wood lice, ground with nutmeg and sugar. <laughs> these things are meant to be a cure for cancer. Useless, of course, but harmless. Other medicines were not harmless. These quack chaps wanted to give their medicines a punch to appeal to the public and put terribly dangerous things into them. They put in arsenic and mercury. And Joshua Ward managed to sell these things to the king and queen. Quite astonishing. They could make you blind, paralyze you, they'd even kill you. People turned to these so-called cures out of ignorance and hope. Medicine needed to change, and the Industrial Revolution would change it with new knowledge, radical new ideas, and scientific experiment. But the process started in deepest Shropshire, when an extraordinary doctor began to turn folk medicine into modern science. The story starts with a man suffering from dropsy, a serious heart condition that causes the body to swell up in a most grotesque way, like a balloon. This chap was in serious trouble. He was going to die, and die soon, in a most painful manner. And then a gypsy came along and mixed up a herbal tea, an infusion, and this strange folk medicine actually started to work. This gypsy, it seemed, had succeeded where doctors had failed. William Withering, a doctor with a very rational turn of mind, heard about this, was intrigued, and wanted to find out more. Withering scoured the countryside and finally managed to obtain a list of the ingredients for the mysterious potion. 
The list is lost to history, but to withering of the 20 items on the page, only one stood out. Foxglove, a deadly poisonous plant that withering knew only something that induced vomiting and hallucinations. Thanks for <laughs> coming here. Now, tell me, what was at stake here? What did Withering hope to achieve by his observations of the... Uh, well, this was such an important observation. This is really the beginnings of modern scientific medicine. Mm. Foxglove mm. had been yeah, used yeah, for centuries, yeah. but not in this respect. Well, the gypsy's cure seemingly works. So what was wrong with that method? <laughs> well, it was totally uncontrolled, and just one casual observation of it being used in a mix of other herbs in this old family recipe really wasn't good enough for withering the scientist. He really had to know just how this substance, whatever it was, could be used to its optimum effect. Withering went to work. He discovered that the ground-up leaves were the most effective part as they contained the strongest concentration of the active ingredient. But foxglove, also known as digitalis, is poisonous, potentially deadly, so dosage was critical. Withering left nothing to chance. His study took him 10 years to perfect. He was a meticulous yeah. scientist. He observed, he experimented, he recorded, and eventually came to his conclusions. And these conclusions hold good today. Withering had scored an early triumph. He had proved that by exploring the disease and precisely measuring the dosage of the drugs used to control it, it could potentially be cured. But the causes of disease were still mostly mysterious. Why, for example, was it that the more people were herded together, the sicker they seemed to get? This is Newgate Jail in London. Being confined here was bad news indeed. The place was filthy and cramped. Disease was absolutely everywhere. In fact, prisoners often died of some ghastly ailment before the hangman could get his hands on them. In October 1750, there was an outbreak of typhus, known at the time as jailhouse fever. It was so bad, not only were prisoners dying, but also members of staff. Something quite simply had to be done. The prison governors looked to Stephen Hales, a country vicar famed for being the first person to measure blood pressure. Hales, like many at the time, believed that disease was caused by bad air. If he could invent a way to get fresh air into Newgate, then jail fever might become a thing of the past. As it turned out, his device worked, but not for the reasons he thought. This is it, Hale's ventilator, an ingenious set of lungs designed to breathe for the prison. Now, the process starts up here on the prison roof. Energy generated by these turning sails of the windmill is transferred to this piston, the shaft of which travels right down here to the interior of the building. So just by turning around, these sails pump air rich in oxygen into the interior of Newgate. Here, among the cells, is a really interesting bit. These bellows are the lungs of the prison, operated by the windmill on the roof. Now, these push fresh air into the cells, but also suck dirty air out. Hales claimed this ventilator reduced prison deaths by half. In Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language of 1755, the definition of ventilator is an instrument contrived by Dr. Hales to supply close places with fresh air. His device would certainly have reduced the spread of airborne diseases such as tuberculosis, even if it hadn't dealt with the true cause of typhus or jail fever, a type of lice not discovered until the 20th century. He could be called the father of air conditioning, and suddenly all the world was interested in his pioneering technology. Hale's ventilators even found a use on the high seas as the Industrial Revolution, hungry for goods, opened up the world to trade. But in the cramped world below decks lurked a disease that would take more than just fresh air to overcome. When Lord Anson returned from his round-the-world expedition of 1744, his men had been slaughtered. Over half his original crew of nearly 2,000 men had died of the same illness. Scurvy. 
The sailors suffered terribly. Their teeth loosened and fell out. Their gums bled and hemorrhaged, which, uh, oh dear, gave a terribly bad smell. Sorry, old chap, but it's, it's true. And then the skin was covered in bruises. Finally came heart failure and death. Scurvy was killing more men than enemy action. A huge array of treatments were being used haphazardly to try and tackle the condition. James Lind, a Scottish naval surgeon, proposed a new kind of trial to find out whether any of them actually worked. So, time to test these six uh, proposed cures on these very sick-looking uh, sailors. Indeed, they all look very sick. This is some cider for you. We're going to give you some seawater, sir. This is sulfuric acid. And this is a mixture of nutmeg and garlic and other things. Now we ought to give some vinegar. Now, we've got for you, sir, an orange and a lemon. And be careful that you eat all of these. It's a very valuable part of the ship's provisions. If you're going to have a fair test, clearly you have to make sure that the people that are given the different treatments are otherwise alike. They had to have scurvy of equal severity, the same basic diet. He nursed them all in the forehold. The only way in which the sailors receiving the treatment differed would be in respect of those treatments. Indeed. Otherwise, they'd be similar. He's methodical, scientific. He has his clinical tests, clinical trials. That was the, the really important breakthrough. And that way of thinking is exactly the way that we today distinguish useful treatments from useless or positively harmful ones. The world's first controlled clinical trial demonstrated that one of the treatments had won hands down. Within a week, the sailors who had eaten the oranges and the lemons were fit for duty and were nursing the others back to health. Science had categorically proved Lynn's case, but the Admiralty was stuck in a different age. It ignored Lynn's findings for over 40 years, and thousands of sailors died needlessly. To progress, medicine needed more than just breakthroughs, it needed patrons. The success of the Industrial Revolution was founded on thinking differently. And in Birmingham, there was one group of outstanding thinkers, including doctors, who would become the intellectual powerhouse of the Industrial Revolution. They were called the Lunar Society. This is Soho House, the home of local manufacturer Matthew Bolton. He'd invite his friends here for convivial evenings, but these evenings were a not only even of pleasure, but also very serious intent. When food was over, the chums would sit around the table discussing ways in which to change the world. And the topics embraced were many indeed. They would talk about manufacturing, commerce, radical politics, the arts, and of course, science. Around the table were men like Josiah Wedgwood, who'd revolutionized modern manufacturing. James Watt, steam engine visionary and Erasmus Darwin, a physician who had the beginnings of evolutionary theory in his grasp years before his grandson, a certain Charles. But it was Joseph Priestley who was poised to take the next big medical leap. Joseph Priestley sat here. Now he was a fascinating fellow. He had an inquiring and radical mind and was intrigued by the emerging ideas of modern medicine. Priestley concentrated his search for health on the stuff of life, air. Priestley had been given this. It's a huge lens that when you shine the sun through it, it heats things up to an incredible temperature. It had apparently belonged to the Grand Duke Cosimo of Tuscany, who'd used it to uh, torture his subjects for fun. But Priestley could think of a much better use for it. So, Mike, Priestley used his massive lens to heat this substance in here. But what was his big idea? What's going on, in fact? Well, that is what Priestley would call the cult mercury. It's here. And he found that when he heated it up with his large lens, it actually split up into a strange gas. A gas coming up here. Yes, indeed. And through all these wonderful tubes, and they're going through there, and coming out the end. Once he got it in a system where he could collect the gas, he could then play. And play he did, observing quickly that this gas, unlike all others, 
had life-giving properties. It seemed to feed a flame, making it spark and burn with great intensity. Mm, look at that, isn't that wonderful? Guys, it is like a blowtorch. Priestley wanted to know the effect of his new gas on the body, but what or who to experiment on? His friend and fellow chemist Humphrey Davy had nearly killed himself by inhaling a large dose of highly toxic carbon monoxide. So Priestley used mice. Now, in an earlier experiment with another gas, the mouse had expired within three seconds, but this time, the mice not only survived, but they thrived. He had, of course, to use this gas on himself. Priestley breathed in the new gas and found it, well, very pleasurable. He wrote, I have discovered an air five or six times as good as common air. In time, this pure air may become a fashionable article in luxury. Priestley called this good air dephagisticated air, but it was not a fashionable luxury. For the first time in history, he'd isolated the very stuff of life. Later on in the 18th century, this air was given his modern name, oxygen. Priestley went on to isolate carbon dioxide. Through his work, it was established how fundamental these gases were to life and health. Further experiments by others led to the discovery of nitrous oxide, laughing gas, which became the first anaesthetic. Medical science was making huge strides, but not yet against the most dreaded disease of all. The speckled monster, as it was called, was a terrifying killer disease. Unlike many diseases which seem to target the poor or undernourished, smallpox you know respect for age, class or status. It was a great leveller. In the 1790s, one enlightened country doctor, Edward Jenner, started to piece together the evidence in the fight against smallpox. His first clue, based on extensive personal observation, was that it wasn't just an old wives' tale. Milkmaids really were exceptionally pretty, mainly because they never caught disfiguring smallpox. They just seem to be immune. Now, Jenner was baffled. Why should smallpox, the seemingly indiscriminate killer of old and young, rich and poor, spare milkmaids? Jenner's second clue came from Turkey, where the wife of the British ambassador, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, reported local women holding smallpox parties. Their children would be given a tiny dose of the dreaded disease. They had discovered that this would protect them from catching it fully. Turkish children were immune, just like the English milkmaids, except milkmaids hadn't been to smallpox parties. Armed with these two clues, Jenna went to the dairy. And what he discovered was that some of the milkmaids had been given a dose of disease, albeit one harmless to humans. Cows suffered from their own disease that caused rather alarming looking pustules called cowpox. He observed that the pustules from the cow were being transferred onto the hands of the milkmaids. They were catching cowpox. Now Jenna made a brilliant lateral leap. Could this be why the milkmaids were immune from smallpox? He decided to experiment. On the 14th of May, 1796, he took eight-year-old James Phipps and introduced the pus from a cowpox sore on the hand of a milkmaid called Sarah Nelms into the arm of the young boy. Two months later, he decided to see if the cowpox had given James any protection against smallpox. There was only one way to do this. James was invited back to have a potentially deadly dose of smallpox plunged into his arm. What James Phipps thought of all this is not reported, but fortunately the cowpox had worked. James had been the first person in Britain to have been successfully vaccinated. He had been part of what was perhaps the single greatest medical discovery of the century. Previously, in bad years, smallpox had accounted for a tenth of all deaths in Europe. 
millions of people, including me, ended up being vaccinated. In fact, right there. Within 200 years, the world saw the last of this terrible disease. In fact, smallpox is the only disease to be fully eradicated and now survives only a limited number of secure government laboratories. But at the same time as the Industrial Revolution was eradicating some diseases, it was creating others. Evidence as to why this might be happening was most abundant in the workplaces of the industrial heartlands. The evidence was mounting that people's health was being ruined by their working conditions. But proof would be needed to force the government to act. Charles Thackeray, a doctor in Leeds, would provide it. Thackeray conclusively proved that there was a link between disease and the conditions people worked in. And he did so with the help of some new technology from France. Armed with this simple device, Thackeray was able to see inside the bodies of his patients with his ears. He was benefiting from the work done by a shy French doctor. René Larnec wanted to listen to the chest of a young female patient, but he was too bashful to place his head on her bosom. Lenek went for a walk to try and devise a solution to his problem. While walking, he saw two children playing around a log. Now, one child was at one end of the log, knocking, while the other child was at the other end of the log, listening. The neck observed the sound travelled through the log with great clarity. It was even amplified. He realised he was on to something. Inspired by what he'd seen and being an excellent carpenter, what the neck did next was this. He created this wooden cylinder. This is actually the prototype, one of the most important medical tools still in use today. Now he could place one end of this new device on his patient's chest and the other to his ear. He could listen and hear how disease congests and obstructs the human body. Ooh. He had, in fact, created the stethoscope. The spirit of scientific inquiry that had led to so many of the great mechanical inventions of the Industrial Revolution was also beginning to unlock the secrets of the greatest and most complex machine of all, the human body. The body was now being explored in greater detail than ever before. The basic anatomy of the body had been well established in the 16th century, but this new work was far more sophisticated. This is William Hunter's Anatomy of the Human Gravid Uterus. It's the first modern view of the human body, and the plates show the body inside and out in incredible clinical, unemotional, scientific detail. System by system, doctors were overturning 2,000 years of hearsay, speculation and hope and replacing them with fact, reason, and close observation. Real human bodies were hard to get hold of, so surgeons and students worked with wax models like these, beautifully made and uh, grimly authentic in their detail. But good as these models and drawings are, they were no substitute for the real thing. Medical men still needed bodies for dissection.
the only legal source of bodies for dissection was the gallows, the bodies of executed murderers. But they did not supply enough material. High demand and low supply meant the dead bodies became a very valuable commodity. A good-sized fresh body could sell for up to 16 guineas in the early 19th century, while children were sold by the inch. And grave robbing wasn't even strictly a crime, because nobody owned the bodies of the dead. But the whole business of body snatching was fraught with ambiguity and double standards, as proved by the case of Sir Astley Paston Cooper. Eminent medical men like Sir Astley Cooper, he was very eminent indeed, being a surgeon to King George III. These chaps were quite happy to employ body snatchers to acquire material for dissection. But there was something more than a little hypocritical in Sir Astley's behaviour. There's evidence in this secure crypt that he was adamant that his body wouldn't suffer the fate he'd inflicted on the bodies of so many people. He ordered that when he died, his remains should be fortified in this massive stone sarcophagus. He was determined that his grave should be body snatcher proof. So Astley's precautions reflect the public mood of the time. People were furious about the widespread pilfering of graves. The Times newspaper even called for grave robbing to be made a capital crime. On the other side of the divide, the medical profession was also up in arms. Medical progress, they argued, had come from an understanding of anatomy derived from the dissection of a vast number of bodies. Now that supply of bodies was about to dry up. Medical progress, said doctors, would grind to a halt. Then the government intervened. And they sided with science. The 1832 Anatomy Act ordered that the body of anyone who died in poverty would be given to the anatomists. In the next hundred years, the bodies of nearly 60,000 poor people were dissected in London alone. It's shocking, but the Anatomy Act finally made the teaching and advancement of medicine possible in a consistent, repeatable and truly scientific way. For 2,000 years, our understanding of the human body had virtually stood still. But finally, haphazard inquiry gave way to scientific method. And by the early 19th century, doctors were able to diagnose, prevent, and cure illnesses in ways that would have been impossible to imagine only 100 years before. As the Industrial Revolution transformed Britain, its effects were physically etched on the landscape. The achievements of engineers and industrialists were more visible, but those of medical pioneers were no less important. There was a new perception of medicine's place in society. There was still an enormous amount to learn, but it was during the Industrial Revolution that the foundations of modern medicine were laid.